Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, while I uh, am getting pulling my slides up, um, I want to make sure that everyone has something to take away from my talk. My uh, topic is a little niche. I uh, work in a clinical trial uh, software company. So we we make software for clinical trials to make their operations run faster and smoother. Um, so I want to make sure that when I'm talking about the things that I'm talking about today, uh, that everyone has something to take away uh, from my presentation. So if you could drop in the chat, uh, where um, where you're listening in from and what your job title is. Uh, that'll help me tailor what I say uh, so that I can then make sure that you have something to take away. So just drop in the chat what your job title is and what you do, and then that'll help me uh, make sure that it's an interesting presentation for you all and you're not bored. Um, so while you're doing that, I'll go ahead and give a little bit of an intro. Uh, thank you for my introduction and thank you for having me here today. Um, are you able to see my slide deck? You can see engineering innovations in a highly yes. regulated space. Okay, awesome. All right, well, uh, my name is Bo Bruno. Thank you uh, for listening to me talk today. I know we are a little bit behind time, so I'll try to speed it up. Um, so today's topics, basically, I want to give you a little introduction about myself. Who am I? Uh, who are we at Florence? Um, where the e-clinical space is today? Um, and lastly, like how we innovate uh, without compromising compliance, right? Like the clinical trial industry is a highly regulated space. Um, and so you, it's a little intimidating to think about how do we develop products um, in, in, the in the clinical trial industry um, without compromising uh, regulatory compliance. Um, so I wanna make sure that you guys have your own takeaways. So be sure to uh, answer or ask any questions in the chat as I'm going through this. Uh, so a little bit about me, whoops. I, uh, whoops, give me one second, yep. Uh, so I just graduated from Georgia Tech, which is a school in Atlanta, Georgia. I graduated with a degree in biomedical engineering. I worked on several medical device projects throughout my tenure at Georgia Tech. Um, things like uh, a spinal surgery simulator to train surgeons on lateral access lumbar spinal surgery. Um, I worked on a uh, retractable skin biopsy punch, among uh, a few other things. Um, and then I recently just started at Florence Healthcare, um, which is the company I'm at today. Uh, back in June, I'm coming up on six months, and I'm focusing on new evaluation evaluating new product opportunities. Um, so really uh, just digging into the research and seeing what's out there and how we can, uh, you know, make the clinical trial industry run smoother and faster because of how long it takes to bring cures to market. Um, and I have some links down below uh, for how you can connect with me, but I will go over those at the end. So about seven years ago, our, our founders realized that there's an office like this in every single clinical trial site, just loads of paperwork, binders, boxes, uh, toner, you name it, it's there. Um, and what, what they realize is that, you know, this is a huge inefficiency. How do you run uh, clinical trials when you have to deal with so much paperwork? I can't even imagine how much longer it takes when you have to print things out, go to your uh, go to your patient visits, have them write stuff. And then how do you share that data with, with the sponsor um, that's paying you to run this study? Obviously, it's a very inefficient process. And so they realized that this was a massive bottleneck within the clinical trial process. And they wanted to make sure or they wanted to try to alleviate that problem. They also realized that no one was focusing on clinical trial sites specifically. Everyone was catering these software products to the sponsor. And while that's that's great and that that can still help uh, bring software products to market to help advance clinical trials. It wasn't site focused and that wasn't actually alleviating the problems that were happening at the site. Clinical trial sites are the central hub uh, today of where clinical trials are taking place, right? They're the ones that are seeing patients. They're the ones that are administering medication. They need to be the ones that are the focus of software design um, when uh, trying to make things more efficient. Um, so they started out with just regulatory binders, um, and this is our suite of products today. So it started with regulatory binders all the way on the left. And uh, for those who may or may not be uh, familiar with clinical trials, these are the documents that make sure that everyone is trained. The site is uh, allowed to do what they're doing. Um, they have all the, the necessary paperwork. Um, and so th that was what was the first product to come out of Florence, which was eBinders, uh, also known as EISF um, or e-regulatory that eventually morphed into uh, eTMF. TMF is the whole story of the study uh, that the sponsor has. Um, and then the ISF is the story um, of the study at the clinical trial site. 
those two things morphed into eHub, which is a whole platform um, that sponsors can distribute to sites to administer some studies. So the all of the sites that are participating in that study will get access to our EISF platform, and they'll be able to share uh, data and documents with their sponsor. And then also what's coming out um, in early uh, January is uh, eConsent, um, which is informed consent uh, online for uh, participants and patients that are participating in clinical trials. Um, so uh, so it's, it's good to start with a vision statement, right? You got to know what your ultimate goal is. And so the overall goal of Florence Healthcare, we want to advance clinical trials um, or help advance clinical trials to bring cures to market faster. It takes on average, I want to say 12 years and literally millions of dollars to bring, uh, to test and uh, make sure that drugs are safe to be marketed. Um, and so our, our goal is to advance that uh, process by making it easier for clinical trials and sponsors to bring uh, cures to market by uh efficiency, making their uh, workflows more efficient. So what you're seeing on the screen now, this is more of our innovations vision statement, and it categorizes how we think about product development. So we want to solve sites content problem, clinical trial sites content problem, and also uh, fix uh, sponsors access problem. Uh, so when we are developing new products, we want to think about how we can alleviate those two problems in order to address that inefficiency problem. So let's review some key terms uh, just for the sake of this presentation. So I told you I got my degree in biomedical engineering and I'm currently working in innovations. And so when you think of an engineer, you might think of someone who's like in a dark basement, just writing uh, calculus and hieroglyphics next to shapes. And uh, that is also what I think of, uh, right? But in terms of this presentation, um, what I think of engineering is really just breaking down a large complex problem into smaller components to address them iteratively, uh, individually, and systematically. Um, and it's really just taking the bigger picture, trying to do as much research as possible, saying, all right, what do we have in front of us? And then just breaking down those little things and seeing where can we address different problems within this uh, larger issue. Um, and then in innovation, it's really summed up great by this quote, uh, one of my favorite quotes by Brian Halligan, who is the CEO of HubSpot. Uh, he says, innovation, imagine the future and fill in the gaps. Uh, um, so by combining these two things is really how I like to imagine innovating um, in a regulated space. Um, and when he's talking about innovation um, and imagining the future and filling in the gaps, I like this framework because it aligns the thought, the perspective of innovation, innovating with uh, the same perspective as goal setting, right? You have some goal and then everything that you do up to that goal is just steps, just steps of improvement towards that goal. And so when you think about innovation that way, where you have this idealistic uh, state, State, then everything you do to get to that goal is no longer this breakthrough innovation. All you're really doing is improving little by little in different chunks of a larger problem to get to that ideal state that you can imagine for how things could and should run. Um, so how does this apply to clinical trials? Um, it started uh, when we first, uh, when the company first started, it started with just looking at the relationship between the sponsor and the coordinating site. And they wanted to maximize uh, the workflows throughout this process. And you can see that little line right through there. Uh, and that's the relationship. Um, and then what, what I did now is uh, look at what are all the other things in this clinical trial ecoscape, e sorry, uh, landscape. Uh, there's local clinics, telehealth visits, uh, uh, EPRO, which is patient reported outcomes and wearables. Um, and so there's also patients, like where do patients fit into this larger picture? Uh, picture? So by doing this, you start to get a bigger idea of the whole problem. Um, and then it brings up certain questions, right? Like what is being shared between these different parties? How to, um, what processes within these relationships need to be improved to advance clinical trials? And once you start asking these questions and you start talking to people in these different parties, you start realizing that there's a ton of bottlenecks and you can start addressing them uh, to develop products and boost those efficiency um, efficiencies in workflows. Um, so, I am an analyst, right? That is my, my job title. So I figured I might as well provide you with some uh, trends that we're seeing within clinical trials. So the first one is decentralized trials. Um, it is decentralized as a term um, has become so much so synonymous with cryptocurrency and financial tech, um, but it's not really what it means in this context. I'll get to that in a second. And the last one is patient as the consumer. So we're finally seeing participants being seen as the main consumer when uh, clinical trials are being designed um, and developed. Um, so 
in terms of recruitment, enrolling, um, consent, they're finally focusing on how can we do this to make sure that it's the easiest and most effective uh, way for the participant to go through the process. So decentralized trials are really just utilizing technology to um, increase remote access. Um, so clinical trial sites are, like I was saying earlier, the central hub for clinical trials. So decentralized trials basically allow them to remove their, um, uh, sorry, there, it allows them to remove their tie to a geographic location um, in areas like patient recruitment and monitoring when sponsors have to come and review documents um, at the clinical trial site. So it allows the clinical trial sites um, and sponsors to be more flexible by using technology such as uh, remote monitoring um, or telehealth even. Imagine uh, you have to drive two hours for a clinical trial site. That's very difficult, right? Like it, some people, it might be easy. You might have a car, you might have the time to go do that. But to do that every week is difficult. And so by enabling something like telehealth, um, participants can just log on and do what we're doing right now um, and talk to their patient over the computer. Um, and so that eliminates the need to drive two hours. And so that's an example of decentralized trials. Um, things like ePro, patient reporting outcomes, where we all have we all have phones, right? We all have a way to communicate. And so you can type on your phone what how you're feeling, how the medication is affecting you, and take surveys on your phone that then get sent to the sponsor um, to evaluate how effective and safe the drug is. Um, and also uh, with e-consent. E-consent also ties into this idea of patients being seen as the consumer, right? So e-consent allows patients to consent to um, a clinical trial remotely. They can do it from home over telehealth. Um, they can have a uh, very well thought out informed consent process to know what they're getting into, to know if they meet the inclusion uh, or exclusion criteria um, and do that remotely. So that's where we're seeing that patients are being tied in to the clinical trial uh, design uh, finally, which is very important. Um, and so how do we innovate, right, in a space with so much red tape? And that's not to say that red tape is, is a problem, right? We have red tape and regulations for a reason. Our, the clinical trials industry um, has a history of unethical practices, right, and even in just the past 100 years. Um, and that's why we have so many regulations um, and making sure that what we're doing, when we're testing out new drugs and new devices, we're doing them safely um, and responsibly. So there... Oh, sorry. There are so many bodies that are making sure um, that we're doing this um, correctly. And, and the first three are just uh, U.S. based. Right. We have the FDA, we have HIPAA, we have IRB um, in Europe. We have uh, the general data privacy regulations. And so imagine trying to launch a drug or sorry, imagine just trying to run a clinical trial in 200 plus countries with 200 plus regulatory probably more, probably a hundred, uh, or sorry, a thousand plus regulatory bodies that are trying to make sure that you're doing what you're doing safely, right? So the way that I like to think about it when we're talking about innovating within a clinical trial space and just creating products for clinical trials to use is that regulation compliance should be your value proposition. Compliance is really twofold, right? You have to have compliance in the systems that you're using, but you have to have compliance in the processes in how you use that system. I can have the most locked down database in the world on my computer. No one can access it. But if I don't have a password on my laptop and my roommate can walk in and just open up the database, that's not a compliant system. That is not compliant. Uh, that is not locked down at all, right? So when we were developing e-consent, we asked, how can we de-risk the shift to e-consent for our customers? And so what we found out is we can help sites to uh, work, or sorry, we can work with sites to help them with IRB approval. So they can uh, work with their IRBs and say, hey, this is how we're planning um, on running our consent process. And we wanna utilize an electronic tool to allow our participants to consent remotely. Um, and so we realize that we can help them in that process. That kind of ties in with white glove service, uh, as we like to call it. So it's giving customers the resources they need to build compliant processes. We've even helped uh, clinical trial sites uh, write SOPs, which also stands for uh, standard operating procedures to adopt processes uh, that enable them to use our products compliantly. And then lastly is focus on customer buy-in. So when we are helping them establish these uh, compliant procedures, they are working with our, our tool, right? They're, they're 
figuring out how they're going to use it. And when we do that, that makes them feel compelled to stay with the product because they just put in all this work to help make sure that they're doing it correctly and compliantly. Um, so moving on, I want to talk about something called the clinical trial paradox. So clinical trials, uh, you know, I, I, uh, this this chart is called the diffusion of innovation. It's basically uh, the stages of adoption of a product when it's released to market. So think about the iPhone when it was released in 2007. When it was first released, the, the, the uh, axis on the bottom is time um, and the, the y-axis is uh, adoption. So when it was first released, think about the, the first people who got an iPhone, right? They were venturesome. They were interested in new ideas. They didn't care about what the product did. They just wanted to try it themselves. They were the first 2.5% of the market um, or of the population to try this product. Whereas think about someone like, I don't know, my grandfather who just got an iPhone last year because he was skeptical of change, right? He didn't know uh, what it was going to do for him. If he probably maybe didn't even see that there was any benefit for him. Um, so he was late to get the product, right? The, the iPhone's been around for almost 14, 15 years now, and he's now just getting one as compared to the people who got the first iPhone. Um, so uh, clinical trials. Uh, so, uh, sorry. So regulations, right. They make change management within clinical trial practice difficult. It's hard to change what you're doing when you have to be, uh, compliant with regulations. So when it's difficult to make changes, it makes it more difficult to try new things. Um, and that's what, uh, makes it uh, difficult uh, for clinical trials to, uh, innovate. Right. And so, when it comes to things that the clinical trials are doing, they are literally developing medical technology. They're on the cutting edge. They're, they're finding out what can work to solve cures, to make uh, humans uh, less susceptible to diseases. We heard with vaccines in the last presentation, trying to stop the pandemic, right? So they're on the cutting edge of medical technology. But when it comes to cloud-based services and uh, just technology to help improve their workflows, they're laggers when it comes to that. And that's because of the regulations making change management difficult, which makes uh, you know innovating in that space difficult, right? So a good example to explain this, right? We have been utilizing electronic health records for almost 20, maybe even 25 years. But why is it that in our clinical trials, we're still collecting patient data on pen and paper? It just blows my mind, right? It just doesn't make sense. Um, so when I tell people that I innovate within clinical trials, I think it's the easiest job in the world. I'm not coming up with the next technology that's going to blow everyone away, right? All the technology has already been invented. I'm just applying it to a new industry and trying to help uh, shape that industry and train that industry on how they can use it to better their practices. So what's the method? And this is really a method, just the scientific method that you can break down um, to evaluate any new innovation, right? Or any new thing that you want to test is obviously starting by researching it. What's the big picture? Analyzing it. What are the smaller components uh, of that? Making hypotheses based off of that and then testing it. Uh, something that we've been doing um, or something that I do within um, uh, my department is we hold uh, interviews within uh, just clinical trials. We just go out and ask people and we test our hypotheses against those people and say, hey, what do you think about EPRO? Is, um, so I'll ask a site, what do you think about EPRO, patient reported outcomes? And they'll say, you know, we don't have a need for that. That is typically something a sponsor will buy from us. And so I say, okay, now that is another hypothesis that I can then test against another clinical trial site. So I'll go to another clinical trial site, ask them the same question. So I'll say, flip it around. I'll say, Hey, so I know that ePro is a sponsor provided tool. Do you have any interest in this? And they'll say, Oh no, actually we utilize ePro without any need for sponsors uh, to ask for it. And then just iterating on that, as I just uh, showed in that example is just keep testing those uh, hypotheses until you move them from hypotheses of what I think I know to what I do know. And so the big takeaway, sorry, I'm almost done. The big takeaway uh, is to be intentional with product development, making sure that, you know, when you have an industry that you're trying to innovate in um, and they are laggards, right? There's difficult for change. You have to be intentional with how you design your products. You have to make sure that you are, uh, you know, their needs and that when you're developing things, they're not just going and testing things out without knowing anything about them. You have to know how they're going to be used within a workflow at a clinical trial site or a sponsor. 
Uh, and then lastly, ask, you have to talk to people. You have to know you, I talk with a lot of companies, uh, in the e-clinical space that are also software vendors. And I hear time and time again, these assumptions that they make. And I just know that they're not talking to people. They're just making these assumptions and not asking anyone. And it's like, oh, it's bizarre because how do you make that assumption without having any evidence to support it? Right. But they don't even know because they're just software developers that are, we think this is how it should work. So you have to be really intentional and ask that. And then iterate. You have to take feedback from those interviews to then develop uh, future products. Um, okay, so this is the thank you. Um, I, I'm going to get to some questions and I'll get back to this. Um, I see someone said, do you think COVID-19 has created a clinical trial backlog? So yes, in a way, um, COVID-19 did kind of, at first, everyone was like, you know, how are we going to see patients when they come, can't come into our, our sites, right? And so COVID-19 actually had a great effect on clinical trials where the industry had to adapt really quickly. And that's where we started seeing things like telehealth uh, come into effect uh, really quickly. They had to switch to Zoom, right? And so that was one change that had to happen abruptly. And now we're at the point where as things may start going back to normal, the industry is realizing that, hey, you know, we started using digital technology. What else can we do to make our uh, uh, online or digitally to make our workflows more efficiently? Um, and so in a way, it created a clinical trial backlog where, you know, less studies were able to be completed because of not being able to see each other in person, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it made uh, the industry realize that there are ways that we can make this industry more efficient. Um, and then the next question is what, I hope I answered your question. If I didn't, please uh, just chat again. Um, and then what does the technology clinical trials, does the technology clinical trials approach is the patient benefit? Uh, so I think that, I think you're asking about what are the benefits uh, from using technology and clinical trials for patient benefits. Um, so like I was explaining, a patient may, well, what, here's another example. Uh, a patient may not know what clinical trials they can take part in, and they may have some rare disease and there may not be medication out there. Um, they can go online to some services that will tell them, they'll put in their symptoms and it'll tell them exactly what clinical trial they may take part in and then how to reach out to that clinical trial. So it's, it's giving patients more access to clinical trials and giving clinical trials more access to patients. Um, so that is, that is where utilizing technology uh, is really beneficial for uh, patients and participants. Um, and the next question is how decentralized clinical trials will reopen the drug development pipeline. Uh, so yeah, so decentralized trials, it's just increasing access and allowing remote, uh, proceed or remote, remote workflows. Um, so it's making the process more uh, cheap and it's making it more efficient. Um, so you can, um, you can, uh, make, uh, you can uh, organize your trials around uh, decentralized trials, increase your recruitment, enrollment, medication compliance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's how uh, drug development will be uh, in the next five to 10 years. Uh, my views about P360, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and then the level of PNC, is that PNC? Can you uh, elaborate on that acronym for me? Uh, what will the future hold in decentralized clinical trials? Um, I, you know, I actually just took part in a clinical trial uh, from University of Chicago. I am currently based in Atlanta, uh, in Georgia, um, and so the the remote the uh, clinical trial was completely held online. I met with my uh, principal investigator uh, online, um, and so. Uh, literally every two weeks, I would just get on a Zoom call. They mailed me my medication. I never had to go anywhere. Um, and that's one way that is a fully hybrid trial, or the, sorry, that's a fully remote trial. Um, whereas the complete opposite of that is me having to go into a clinical trial site, get the medication, do my visits there. Um, and so there's a kind of a, um, uh, a gradient so to speak, um, of how decentralized your trial is, how remote your trial is. So the future, we're never going to get rid of the clinical trials, right? You're obviously still going to have to be able to, there's still going to be studies where you have to go see the doctor, the principal investigator, the clinical trial staff. So you're not going to be able to uh, get to um, a fully remote uh, clinical trial for every study, right? But we can help digitize some processes that make it easier um, to help run clinical trials. Uh, so private and confidential. So yeah, so like I was saying, your systems can be compliant, right? And so we know when we're developing our systems, we are making sure that our systems are compliant. It's very, it's not easy, right? But we know what it has to do. 
it's you can uh, completely eliminate the human uh it's there's no human interaction right you when you're just developing the system what's really important is that human uh aspect in the pro processes when using our systems that's important and that's what i was talking about in, in trying to make sure that um our customers are developing uh compliant processes with our system so making sure that we're hipaa compliant right that's that's it's just a data encryption thing right but on the other aspect of that is making sure that the processes um are compliant as well uh, and then do you agree with the statement traditional methods of clinical trial management are not working nowadays, though few clinical uh, research professionals face issues with the software tools. Uh, so there, I would say that traditional methods, it's not that they're not working nowadays, it's just that they're not as efficient as they could be right and that's the whole goal of what we're trying to do is make some of those processes more efficient um, and obviously people have problems with uh, software tools. Uh, so that you have to design with the end user in mind. If someone can't use your software, that's a you problem because you didn't make it easier, easy enough for them to figure out how to use it. Um, and so that's really why I talk about, you know, you have to ask, you have to know your uh, consumer when you're developing products. Um, how technology can help manage the challenges we can we face in clinical trials. Uh, I mean, there's so many, there's literally so many issues. We talk about recruitment, right? We don't have enough uh, people in our studies. We also don't have enough representation of different types of people and diversity um, in our clinical trials. So enabling patients to remove geographic barriers, um, we can address some of those issues. We can allow clinical trial sites to reach populations that they may have not had access to before. Um, so that's one example uh, of, uh, a issue being solved by remote uh, workflows. Um, but you can go on and on about many different areas that could be improved. We focus on uh, documents, paper documents getting digitized and moved online. Now that data can be shared with a sponsor who no longer has to come to a clinical trial site to review data. Um, they can just do it remotely. Um, I mean, I can keep going on. There's, there's literally <laughs> hundreds of problems with clinical trial site workflows. Um, but uh, yeah, those are those are just some of the main ones. Um, so if there's any other questions, I'd love to I'd love to answer them. Um, I want to thank you for sitting in and listening to my presentation. Um, I, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, my email is here as well. Um, it's just Bo Bruno, and then I also write a weekly blog post about things that I'm learning in clinical trials, um, things that I think are interesting. I talk about innovations within clinical trials, obviously, but also within healthcare um, and just technology that I think is interesting. So, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for your remarkable speech. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.